Hold on, come back, Adam. Um, I just wanted to do a few things before we get started. One of them is I just want to publicly thank Adam. He'll get a formal thank you later. As those of you who remember, um, about a year ago this time, Joy, our organist, went away to, on a Fulbright to, to study. And uh, she went to France. And she has returned. And she'll be joining us back in August. But in that time span, the whole year, just like that, Adam has uh, been, been ministering to us here on the organ. And uh, we will thank him more formally, um, but just want to let you know that these next three weeks are the last uh, in July that you'll see him consistently. You know, he will be subbing from time to time, but just wanted to show our appreciation at this time. Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, yes. What a wonderful day here, service Sabbath. Also wanted to uh, just reemphasize those words from our children's ministry leader, Linda Frias. Those of you who are very devout in your faith and in your belief, many of, much of that took place through things that happened in your adolescence and in your childhood. And many of us would not be sitting in a, in a church or worshiping the God we do without the things we learned when we were younger. So please allow our children that opportunity. We need your help. Please do sign up. There's things to do in the back if you can cook, if you can make some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, a lot. A little goes a long way. So please do... Uh, please do um, Help with that. Let's have a word of prayer before we get into this morning's message. Father in heaven, bless us now as you uh, you speak to us as we pray in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel, can you pass me, please, my phone? Yeah, just the phone. Meet Brittany. Brittany is a woman who considers herself a hard worker. Brittany was at the top of her class in high school, and while many of the other girls were caught up in extracurricular activities, Brittany kept her head in the books, striving to make the National Honor Society. Well, she did better than that when she was finished. She graduated at the top of her class. She earned scholarships to the top universities all over the country, and in college, she excelled in all of her studies. I must work harder. I must do better. I must because I can. She would say this day in and day out until she met Andrea. Andrea was another student who was also driven, but much more balanced. The compatibility between the two was perfect. You see, Brittany and Angela instantly connected and the friendship blossomed. Andrea caused Brittany to slow down and help her find balance in her daily routine. Brittany adapted to her newer, slower, even pace of life, and she began to make new friends. She became more outgoing, and most of all, she enjoyed the company of her friend Andrea, now her best friend. They went shopping together, shared hobbies, and made memories, and they became inseparable. Before they knew it, college graduation was upon them. Brittany and Andrea went on from college, and they got different jobs at different offices across town. They still hung out when they could, but as time passed, Brittany would spend more and more hours at work. Quality time with Andrea began to dwindle. And although she was productive at work, her interaction with Andrea became less and less. I know I promised I'd be there for the birthday party, but I, I just can't make it. Sorry, it turns out that I can't meet for lunch tomorrow. I have a meeting. How, how's Friday instead? Oh, was this the weekend that we were supposed to go and see the show? I have a project for work. These were the excuses that Brittany produced, and as the obligations began to multiply, Brittany found herself pursuing her career goals, her life, and her aspirations rather than spending time with others that she held dear, mainly Andrea. Eventually, the separation between the two expanded to a point where they were no longer communicating. Andrea had moved on from Brittany because Brittany was too busy to hang out, too busy for a conversation, too busy to return a text message, too busy for a phone call. All the while, Brittany thought that she and Andrea were still close friends when, in fact, they weren't. 
Many of us look at Brittany in this story and can easily identify her problem. She was too busy. So busy that she lost a friend. So busy that she didn't even realize that Andrea was no longer in her life. But this doesn't really shock us as a problem that's unique to these two people, does it? Why? Because we're busy. We have many obligations on our plates. I have to be a good spouse. I have to be a good parent. I have to perform well on the job. I have to get good grades. I have to do this for the promotion. I have to serve this week for church. I have church business meeting tomorrow at 9.30 at breakfast and then the meeting at 10. I have a ministry team meeting. I have to plan this event for my family. My parents are sick. I am the caretaker. My children need tuition money. My car is broken. I'm late for work. My home needs repairing. I have medical bills to pay. I have to keep my business afloat. I have to manage my retirement savings. I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to. The list just goes on and on, doesn't it? Just reading this, I just... My blood pressure was just rattling. There always is something to do. Always. And how do we get this way? It's our culture, our American culture. Chasing the American dream that doesn't exist. It's a culture that makes us feel as though we must get to the next thing. But that is not a lifestyle that God wants for us. What's this? Not just any cell phone. What kind of phone is it? It's a smartphone. <laughs> Remember somebody says, I have a dumb phone. No, this is a smartphone. You see, once upon a time, this didn't exist. There was a time I remember having to go to the one phone in the house. The one phone in the whole house. And it had a rotor where you pick up the phone and you would physically put your finger and then you turn and then you wait and then you turn and you would get frustrated the people who had zeros in their phone number because it's just so much effort. You knew their numbers by heart. The sole purpose of the telephone was allow people in two different locations to communicate to each other. That was the only function of the telephone. Now we have these. Brilliant. <laughs> Genius, really, if you think of it. This device serves as everything essential to our lives. It's also interesting that the feature of this phone, which is connecting people in two different locations, is the feature of least significance. Think about it. This is my calendar. This is my radio, this is my CD collection, my computer, this is my map, this is my news, my health guide, my fitness coach, my cooking instructor. This is my banking, this is my gaming console, my shopping guide, Amazon, eBay, anybody? My metronome, my portable piano, half of my Ellen White literature is on here. We have 30, like you have as many Bibles as you want on here. Then my devotional is on here. The World Wide Web is on here. And one of the primary ideas of Steve Jobs, the creator of the iPhone, was that the power of the hand was significant. He knew this. And because the, the hand gives power to the sword and to the pen, therefore, the hand should have the access it needs to continue doing the most monumental of life's tasks. This is one of the reasons why your smartphone fits in your hand. Through this device in your hand, you have access to the world. And you can literally do hundreds of thousands of things with this device in your hand. Stay with me. We're talking about busyness. Because we have access to all these things in the palm of our hands, subsequently, everything else has access to us. Have you ever been minding your own business and you get a silver alert or an amber alert that doesn't come from any of your contacts? Who has contacted me to tell me about a silver van with this license plate number? Look out for it. Or how about a call from a telemarketer? Or how about a severe weather alert from, I don't know, I don't have the weather app on my phone, but they're telling me that a thunderstorm is coming. Access to me. We not only have access to these various things, but various things also have access to us. 
And please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the phone or this device is bad or evil, but rather it's something, this, this concept is something that we need to be aware of when it comes to busyness. I have learned the hard way that this, the Bible on my phone, um, I should not use the Bible on my phone as my primary source of Scripture. Let me explain why. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I offer a prayer of thanks that I'm alive. And after the prayer, I turn to my phone. <laughs> my phone and I open my Bible app. And as I begin to read my devotion, my thoughts are jogged. Did they respond to that email? Did they hear what I said? Let me check briefly. Oh wait, my coworker just sent me a text. Yes, it's 6 a.m., but I'm compelled to respond. And before you know it, I'm checking and replying to email. 20 minutes has gone on, and my schedule is off. I quickly switch back to my Bible app, only to have His Royal Majesty, Jude Otley, my son, wake up and tell the whole neighborhood he knows how to sing the alphabet. Or yell at this point. And now it's time to go. I got to check the traffic. What route should I take to work? What's the weather look like? Let me open my weather. Let, let, let me see what's, where's the weather app or, or another crazy article just pops up. Something else that Congress has done that's embarrassing. And by this time, I've strayed so far from my devotional thought, I barely read before I got distracted. And it's time to go. Then I get to the church and pastor reads and pastor preaches from Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. Still. Be still. Be what? What is that? I can barely sit quietly for two minutes without getting fidgety. Feel free to judge me if you want, but for me, it may be my phone or certain aspects of technology. But for you, it may be something else. And the truth is, you know that I'm not alone in this struggle. Some of you have sent a text message or glanced at your phone for potential non-Sabbath-related purposes since the service began. Or maybe you addressed an issue in conversation with your with the fellow member that really isn't related to worship. I'm not condemning you. It's simply making the point that some of us have trained ourselves to always be doing something, to always keep going. So let's look at the first portion of our scripture reading. Still and know that I am God. Let's look at the first two words, be still. It's not a suggestion or a recommendation. It's a command. God wants us to stop. As a matter of fact, we can read it like this. Stop and know that I am God. Stop what you're doing so you can see me for who I am. Stop so you can hear what I've been waiting to share with you. Stop so your mind can finally stop running and focus on something worthwhile. Look at it this way. When an archer, one of my favorite sports to watch in the Olympics is archery. When the archer takes the bow and the arrow, takes the bow and places on the string and then causes the tension, the most important aspect of what the archer is doing is not the amount of tension, the type of arrow, or the bow. It's the aim. The aim dictates where the arrow lands. The slightest degree in any direction affects if the, the landing place of the arrow. And the same is applied to us when seeking to live a purposeful life under God's instruction. Stopping at the beginning of the, of the day allows us to hear from God and impacts the way our day unfolds. Impacts the way our day unfolds, and that's the aim. So have you ever wondered why you may be in church um, and you may tune out, or you may drift off in your thoughts. I sometimes hear people say, this church thing really isn't for me. Or why do we even go to church? I don't feel the connection there. Or there's nothing at that church for me. I, you know, I need to do something. I know what I'll do. I'll sign up for a service Sabbath activity. I'll hope to feel something while I serve. Well, the first misconception is that church isn't for you. It's not even for me. 
Some say, but I need this to get through the week. Spoiler alert, worship has never been about what we need. Worship is about giving God what he deserves. So when we come here together, we come here in response to God's invitation to meet him in worship. We come to meet an audience of one. When we give God our worship, he accepts it, and then he shares his presence and his glory. His presence is what blesses us. Do you see the order? He invites, we worship, then he blesses with his presence. But some of us are accustomed to expecting the blessings after only giving little or nothing at all. And that may be because God is gracious in wanting to share his presence with us, but that's not how it's meant to be. So here's the question. What did you bring to the table? Where is your sacrifice? Where is your worship? Where is the overflow from your personal worship throughout the week that you brought with you to this corporate worship service? Where is your testimony? Where is your word of inspiration to share in Sabbath school or with a friend? Where is your sacrificial giving that you've been holding on to? Where is your joy? Where is it? It's not because the preacher is not engaging. It's not because the choir didn't sing your song or sang it differently, or that someone may have judged you at the door because of what you may have been wearing. It is because our corporate worship experiences is simply an extension and in many ways a reflection of our personal and private worship experiences. If, in our, private wor- if our private worship is healthy and growing every day of the week, then our corporate worship experience will follow, regardless of the circumstances. If our personal and private worship is lacking, so will your corporate worship experience. You may say, well, pastor, there have been many times where the week went by and I didn't get in the Word. I missed out on my personal devotion, um, but the worship on Sabbath was so powerful. It was so moving. It was so inspiring. I needed that to get me through the week. It gave me what I needed. Well, I would submit to you that the blessing you received on those occasions was just the residue of what God actually had in store for you to receive. Hopping from congregation to congregation, following preacher to preacher, attending church, attending a church because that expression of worship matches yours, or even signing up for an activity on service Sabbath or any church-wide initiative only addresses the symptoms of your longing for connectedness. The only cure comes in the privacy and the intimacy of your one-on-one time in God's presence. Here's one of my favorite quotes from an author called A.W. Tozer. He's a worship theologian. He says, unless in our worship we experience the presence of God, it cannot rightly be called Christian worship. Once we experience the actual presence of God, we will lose all interest in cheap Christianity with all its bells and whistles trying to compete with the world. Finding a quiet corner without distraction cannot be underestimated when it comes to remaining in God's presence, and we should patiently wait for God. There's no need to rush. Wait until he breaks through the tough exterior of your consciousness. How else can you face the challenges and stay in your right mind? Matthew 6, this is something that Jesus shares with us. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. If you don't have a growing and active personal relationship with God, you're missing out on what he has for you. So let's go back to our verse for this morning, Psalm 46.10. It says, be still and know that I am God. We talked about being still talking about no. Both words in the Hebrew are in the declarative form. They're both a command. God says, know who I am. Get to realize who I have been all this time. Through your pain, through your joys, through your hurts, through your questions, through your doubt, through your fear, through your anxiety, through your darkest moments, come to know who I really am. I am your deliverer. I am your healer. I am your way maker. I am your encourager. I am your provider. Have you forgotten? I am your guide. I am your sustainer. 
I am your friend. Don't you remember? I am your father. I am God. I am. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and put aside the distractions. Be still and stop multitasking. Be still and stop trying to do it all. Be still and stop swinging and missing. Just be still. The title of this message is Martha, Martha. I want to quickly share with you this story in Luke 10, um, chapter 38. Um, Luke 10, verse 38 to 42, it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one, and Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. There are two points I would like to bring out from this story. The first one is before you jump on Martha, as many people do, and condemn her for being too busy, note that we need Martha in order for this story to work. We need Marthas in this world today. Marthas organized our service Sabbath. (laughs) Marthas help put things in place so things happen. Without Marthas, nothing gets done. It was Martha's home. Martha likely paid the mortgage, and Mary was just with her. Jesus had needed a place to stay, and it had not been for Martha, Jesus would not have had a place to go. But the key point here is Mary's position and her posture. And although there was much to do, much to get done to further the purpose of the gathering, Mary's first inclination was not to go and do, but to sit and listen. She assumed the correct posture we ought to have when pursuing Jesus. Imagine if we were to take more time each day just to sit and just to listen. The Bible frequently references the amount of work that needs to be done to spread the gospel. Jesus said the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. He told Peter, Peter, feed my sheep. He told the disciples, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And we have responded accordingly. Today is service Sabbath, and we center ourselves around serving others. Hours and hours have gone into today happening, each, each and every week. However, we cannot adequately serve or minister to others if we first have not taken the time to sit in God's presence, bask in the quietness that has been marginalized in this society, and listen to the still small voice of our Creator. Point number two, there is something unique in this passage. Jesus says, Martha, Martha. He says her name twice. I've always wondered why twice. She's standing right there. We know that God knows us all by name. And in fact, there have been other instances in Scripture which you may consider more severe, but God only calls his individual's name once. I remember when Adam bit the apple and just threw this whole thing into a chaos of sin. He says, Adam, where are you? One Adam. When his brother and good friend Lazarus was dead and he wanted to make one of the most dazzling um, um, spectacles of God's power, he says, Lazarus, come forth. One Lazarus. But he says, Martha, twice. Why twice? There are only a few times in Scripture where God calls someone's name twice. The first one is in Genesis 22. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, twice. Let's look at, um, I think it's Acts, 
Acts chapter 9. As he neared Damascus on the journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. We're talking about Saul, him. Saul. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Twice. Last one in, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. It says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could it be that God equates Martha's busyness to the danger of Abraham almost committing murder? Could it be that God equates Martha's busyness to the ruthless persecution of Christians done by Saul? Could it be that God equates Martha's busyness to the mistreatment of Jesus on the cross? Do each of these situations, do they all evoke the same response from God because the severity is all the same? Is the level of danger the same? Is the level of importance all the same? Does missing time with him in worship because we are too busy just bring up the same emotions all over again? When he calls out to us twice, as he did with these people, it means stop, beware, watch out, listen to me. This is important. And God is telling us today, Anwar, Anwar, John, John, James, James, Renee, Renee, Tacoma, Tacoma, stop. Be still and know who I am. In our opening story, Brittany, she's over here, Brittany was so busy that she didn't even realize that she had strayed away from Andrea. Andrea eventually went her own way, thinking that Brittany was done in their friendship. In this story, we are Brittany. Both Brittany and Martha, like many of us, are busy Sometimes doing all the right things. Work to provide for those we love, volunteer service in church, the community, and so much, much, much more. But God is telling us that spending time to serve him is not the same as taking time to know him. Spending time to serve him is not the same as taking time to know him. Sure, your loved ones have food on the table, clothes on their back, your kids are getting a great education, or you're diligently studying to maintain your good grades, you serve on the board or on a ministry team. But how well do you know Christ? Or perhaps you're an empty nester. The kids are gone, so you're either close to or you're in retirement. You too have given thousands of lifelong hours to serving Jesus and the body of Christ. But how well do you know him? In our pastor's meeting, every time we get together, the pastor, the president of our Potomac Conference, Bill Miller, he always does our worship devotionals. He starts off his devotional with the same question. I can see a smile on his face. He says, how is your relationship with Jesus? It's a simple question, but it's also loaded, right? Makes you think about the times you may have spent, you could have spent with him, but you chose not to. It also brings up the times that you have spent with him. And in marriage counseling, there's a well-known principle that in a relationship, there are two entities, two people, and they're always moving in a direction. You're either moving towards each other or towards isolation. There, isn't a, there is not a middle ground in a relationship. 
There's not a stagnant area where you could just be on pause. The same is true with our walk with Christ. And, we're do, and we are either moving closer to him or we're moving further away from him. So there was a song written by Larnell Harris, which speaks directly to this message, and I'm going to share a portion of it with you. It says, There he was just waiting in our old familiar place, an empty spot beside him where once I used to wait. To be filled with strength and wisdom for the battles of the day. I would have passed him by again, but I clearly heard him say, I miss my time with you, those moments together. I need to be with you each day And it hurts me when you say you're too busy Busy trying to serve me But how can you serve me When your spirit is empty There's a longing in my heart Wanting more than just a part of you, it's true. I miss my time with you. This is Jesus saying it. He says, I miss my time with you. Those moments together. I need to be with you each day And it hurts me when you say you're too busy You're busy trying to serve me But how can you serve me When your spirit is empty There's a longing in my heart wanting more just a part of you it's true I miss my time with you it does something to me inside when the human part of Jesus appeals to me he says I miss you The good news is that Jesus is not like Andrea in our story. He doesn't disappear when we ignore him. He doesn't hold grudges. He doesn't resent you if it's been a while since you've really connected. In fact, he is ready and he is waiting to talk to you again. So no matter where you are in your life journey, please know that he is ready to spend time with you. Quality, uninterrupted time. All we need to do is be still and know that he is God. Amen.